Welcome to Talks at Google. I'm pleased to introduce Nicole Younger Halpern, who is here to talk about her book, Quantum Steampunk, The Physics of Yesterday's Tomorrow. Dr. Younger Halpern received a doctorate in physics from Caltech. She won the International Ilya Prigogine Prize for her thermodynamics PhD thesis. In her field of research, she re-envisions 19th century thermodynamics for the 21st century using the mathematical toolkit of quantum information theory. She coined this research quantum steampunk. The Institute of Physics recognized her with the International Quantum Technology Emerging Researcher Award. She is a theoretical physicist currently employed by the National Institute of Standards and Technology and a fellow of the Joint Center for Quantum Information and Computer Science, where she leads a research group. If you're viewing this live, please add questions at any time to the chat so we can get to them later. And now, Dr. Younger Halpern will give a presentation about quantum steampunk. Thanks so very much for the introduction. Can we see, can you share my screen now? Wonderful. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Thanks especially to the Google Quantum AI group and to the Talks at Google team for helping coordinate this. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. I spent a year studying physics here in a city called Waterloo in Canada near Toronto. So Waterloo excels in theoretical physics, tech startups, and winter. Lots and lots of winter. One day on a study break, I visited the Waterloo Public Library. And there I found this novel by the Canadian poet Jay Ruzeski, The Wolsenberg Clock. So one scene takes place in Austria during the 1800s. An inventor is standing on a balcony, looking down onto the ball ballroom below, which he's converted into a workshop. So he and his family members build automata, you know, clockwork driven elephants and snakes and so on. So this inventor is gazing down on his miraculous creations with his overcoat trailing out behind him. And I think, what atmosphere, what a scene. Soon afterward, I learned that I had encounter steampunk. The steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film. Steampunk stories take place during the Victorian era when the industrial revolution has been humming. Some of the earliest factories are belching smoke. London is full of smog and Sherlock Holmesian mysteries. Railroads are cutting across the American West for the first time. People wear waistcoats or petticoats. Against this backdrop are futuristic technologies, automata, time machines, flying ships, and submarines. Another Canadian poet, Douglas Featherling, has supposedly said, steampunk is a genre that imagines how different the past might have been had the future come earlier. You might have encountered this steampunk novel, The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. It's one of the first steampunk works. It was written during the 1800s. But steampunk is very much with us still. The invention of Hugo Cabret was a New York Times bestseller in the early 2000s. Enola Holmes was one of the first films released on Netflix due to the pandemic. It's about Sherlock Holmes's little sister, Enola. The film was a hit. I loved it. The sequel is coming out soon. The Nevers is a show on HBO about Victorian women who have supernatural gifts. So these works reach back to the past and ahead to the future. This fusion of old and new creates a wonderful sense of nostalgia and adventure, romance and exploration. Fans dress up in steampunk costumes, top hats and goggles and gears and gather at steampunk conventions. Now, this fantasy of steampunk has become a reality in my area of research. So I'm a theoretical physicist. So I model the universe with mathematics. Then I find features of the world that weren't known before that surprise us. These features often crop up in extreme settings that we don't encounter in everyday life, maybe at very low temperatures, maybe in a system of just a few atoms. 
Specifically, I work at the intersection of three fields, quantum physics, information science, and energy science. So I'll briefly preview this intersection, then explain it in detail. The information science is the study of how efficiently we can process information, solve computational problems, secure information cryptographically, and more. Quantum physics is the study of the very small, such as single atoms and ions. They behave in counterintuitive ways that everyday objects can't. Scientists and engineers are leveraging these counterintuitive behaviors to build quantum computers, which will process information in ways impossible for familiar technologies such as my laptop. Thermodynamics is a study of energy. It was developed during the Victorian era to describe the work performed by the cutting edge technology of the day, the steam engine. Today's cutting edge technology includes quantum devices, which are very, very different. So we need to re-envision the thermodynamics of the 1800s for the 21st century. We need to ask how quantum engines would look and what they would achieve. We need to reach back to the past and ahead to the future. The resulting fusion of old and new I call quantum steampunk. So a genre of science fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. So let's look at each of these components more closely. So I feel a little odd lecturing people at Google about information science, but let's ensure that we're all on the same page regarding background information. Information science is the study of how efficiently we can perform information processing tasks. Those include you know, solving computational problems, such as calculating a satellite's trajectory, communicating information, such as over the web, securing information cryptographically, and storing information in memories. We live in the information age, but what is information? It's basically the ability to distinguish between alternatives. So say that a friend of yours asks if the pub down the street, of course in Victorian London, is open or closed. You peer through the window and see either foaming mugs or cleaned mugs sitting upside down on the counter. You've gained the ability to distinguish whether the pub is open or closed. You've gained information. We measure quantities in units, such as seconds or teaspoons. What's the basic unit of information? As many people here would know, it's called the bits. It's the amount of information you gain if you have no idea of the answer to a yes or no question and you learn the answer. Say that when your friend asks about the pub, the pub has a probability one half of being open and a probability one half of being closed. When you peer through the window, you gain one bit of information. We encode a bit in a physical system that can be in one of two possible states, such as a thumb that's pointing upward or pointing downward. In a familiar computer, a bit is encoded in a transistor that has the value one or the value zero. Quantum physics is the study of very small things, such as single electrons or atoms or particles of light, which we call photons. These systems behave in ways impossible for everyday objects, such as books and microphones and human beings. Everyday objects are large, are massive, and contain many, many particles. They're called classical. The quantum physics is non-classical. So what are these counterintuitive quantum behaviors? We can begin to grasp one by imagining that some young physicist, let's call her Audrey, 
has an electron and her brother Baxter has another electron. The siblings can perform some operation on their particles that creates entanglement between them. So entanglement is a relationship that quantum particles can share and classical particles can't. Entanglement creates strong correlations between measurement outcomes. Here's a glimpse of how it works. Suppose that Audrey measures some property of her particle, and the measurement has two possible outcomes, which I'll label one and zero. For instance, Audrey can measure whether her electron has a lot of energy or a little energy. If the two particles are entangled as strongly as possible, she'll have no idea which outcome she'll obtain. So she'll get one and zero with 50-50 chances. Now, suppose that instead, Audrey measures her particle and Baxter measures his. The two siblings can predict something about the joint outcome. In one example, if Audrey obtains a one, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a zero. And if she obtains a zero, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a one. Furthermore, there is a measurement that the siblings can perform jointly on the pair of particles together, such that the siblings can predict the outcome with certainty in advance. So there's something, some information that isn't in Audrey's particle, it isn't in Baxter's particle, it isn't in the sum of the two particles addressed independently. It's spread across the pair. But when it comes to entanglement, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Scientists and engineers are now leveraging entanglement in quantum information science. The quantum information science is the study of how we can use quantum phenomena to process information in ways forbidden for classical systems. Quantum information technologies include quantum computers, networks for communication, cryptographic systems, and more. Quantum computers will be able to solve in minutes certain problems that would take even supercomputers many years. Google was the first to execute such a problem. In 2018, Google made international headlines by performing the first quantum supremacy experiment. So the Sycamore quantum computer solved a toy problem, essentially of quantum random number generation in under four minutes. The team estimated that even a high powered classical computer would need 10,000 years. The latter number has been debated in the months since, but the achievement is groundbreaking. Still, compared to the quantum computers that are under construction, today's quantum computers are small and limited. Many of us in the field expect that will take quite a few more years to build quantum computers up to their full potential. Applications will include information security. If you've purchased merchandise online, say, through Amazon, your credit card information has been secured with a common cryptographic protocol called RSA encryption. Classical computers can't break that safeguard in any reasonable amount of time to the best of our computer science knowledge. Quantum computers will be able to break the safeguard easily. On the other hand, quantum phenomena provide new resources for securing information. In 2017, researchers in China and Austria conducted the first video conference encrypted with quantum resources. An important application of quantum computers will be research and development in material science and chemistry. That might sound dull, but in some countries, food security is at crisis levels. In other countries, food security is at the highest levels ever in history. So fertilizer is extremely important across the globe. 
we invest about 3% of the world's entire energy output in fertilizer production. Why do we spend so much energy? Because we produce fertilizer using an old technique from 1909. Bacteria can accomplish the same goal much more efficiently. But those bacteria use a molecule called nitrogenase that's too complicated for us to simulate on classical computers. The molecule is quantum. So a quantum computer will naturally be better suited to unlocking the molecule secrets. And if all goes as hoped, and that is a very big if, transforming fertilizer production and energy use. Little wonder that governments across the world are pouring funds into quantum research, technology, and education. In 2018, Congress passed the National Quantum Initiative Act, which provided $1.2 billion for quantum efforts. Even more astoundingly, the Senate passed the act unanimously. Everyone in the Senate actually agreed on it. Not only governments, but also loads of companies are investing in quantum science and technology. Here's an advertisement from Microsoft about its quantum products. Of course, Google has a quantum team. IBM, Amazon, and Honeywell have quantum teams. Quantum startups are booming. At least two have become publicly traded in the past few years. An example is Rigetti, whose team is shown here back in March when the company debuted on the stock market. Now, this object belongs to IBM. You know, Google has very similar objects, but I couldn't find exactly the photos I wanted of those. This is not a quantum computer, even though it looks cool enough to be one, doesn't it? But actually, many people think it looks steampunk. So this object holds a quantum computer, which fits on a small chip. The chip needs to be at low temperatures to support quantum behaviors such as entanglement. So this device cools the quantum computer to temperatures lower than that of outer space. So this device is called a dilution refrigerator, or to those of us in the field, a fridge. When my husband heard that, he's a classical computer scientist, he was indignant. And he said, you know, this cools things down to below the temperature of outer space, and you can't even call it a freezer. Anyway, cooling leads us to the third element in our triumvirate, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, the forms that energy can be in, and the transformations amongst those forms. Objects can transmit energy in two forms, heat and work. Heat is the uncoordinated energy of particles jiggling about randomly. Heat is disorganized energy and so isn't directly useful. Work is coordinated energy that can be directly used to power a factory, or charge a battery, or raise an anchor. Heat engines convert random heat into coordinated work. Heat engines throw the Industrial Revolution by powering factories for the first time. Around that era, people started wanting to know how efficiently engines could operate. So they developed the theory of thermodynamics, giving it a practical bent. However, the practical questions led to fundamental questions, such as why does time flow in only one direction, and do materials really consist of particles too small for us to see? Atomism hadn't been entirely accepted by the Victorian era. Now, cooling, expelling heat, is a thermodynamic process. But how do you measure the heat emitted by a quantum system that's cooling down? To measure the heat emitted by a classical system, you can measure the system's energy, cool the system, and measure the energy again. The initial energy minus the final energy is the heat lost. But 
quantum systems are more delicate than classical systems. You might have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So Werner Heisenberg was a German physicist who helped found quantum theory during the 1920s. He intuited that if you measure a quantum system, you disturb it. If you measure a quantum system's energy, you might change the system's energy. So how we can measure quantum heat or even conceive of quantum heat isn't straightforward. Furthermore, this fridge is a large classical system. What if we tried to build a fridge from a quantum system? Could we? How small could we make it? Could quantum phenomena such as entanglement benefit a quantum fridge as they benefit quantum computers? More generally, just as there are information processing tasks, such as encrypting information, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as refrigerating and powering cars and charging batteries. Given that quantum phenomena benefit information processing tasks, can they benefit thermodynamic tasks? How can we extend the Victorian theory of thermodynamics from large classical systems, such as steam engines, to small quantum and information processing systems? These questions underpin quantum thermodynamics, the field in which I work. This field shares its aesthetic, its spirit, with steampunk. And that's why I call my work quantum steampunk. Quantum thermodynamics has roots that stretch back to the 1930s. Right after quantum theory was formulated, people began wondering whether it could explain thermodynamic phenomena. During the 1950s and 60s, researchers designed the first quantum engine. It consists of one atom that you can use in a maser. The maser is like a laser that you know you can point at the floor and wave around to make a little ball of light jiggle around to drive your cat insane. But whereas a laser emits visible light, a maser emits microwave radiation. So it turns out an engine doesn't need gears and cogs and other moving pieces. It needs only one atom. Over the ensuing decades, quantum thermodynamics had a small following. It wasn't seen as a discipline. Some people even said that quantum thermodynamics was an oxymoron. Thermodynamics was invented to describe big classical systems such as steam engines, so thermodynamics couldn't possibly have anything to say about quantum systems. But over the past decade, quantum thermodynamics has experienced a boom. So here is a photo from my community's big annual conference in 2018. We met in Santa Barbara that year. That's why the scenery is gorgeous. We form an international community with hotspots in the United Kingdom, Germany, Brazil, Israel, Switzerland, and elsewhere. A few of us quantum thermodynamicists work in the United States. The US broadly is starting to catch on to the trend. Why has quantum thermodynamics been booming? Quantum information science matured in the early 2000s. It came to offer a wonderful mathematical and conceptual toolkit for understanding quantum systems through how they store and manipulate information. Quantum information science also came to offer unprecedented experimental opportunities. Labs achieved exquisite control over tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms, ions, and photons. We've been using all of these tools of quantum information science to build and test a theory of quantum thermodynamics. So here's an example. We'll start with a classical story that showcases the interplay between information and energy. Then we'll see what quantum physics adds. We can store a bit of information, not just in a transistor, but in 
a gas particle in a box. Suppose that the particle is classical, like a miniature basketball. The particle is a really, really simple gas, at least to a, theoret uh, a theoretical physicist. If the gas is on the particle's right-hand sides, we'll say that it encodes a one. If the gas is on the left-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a zero. By the way, this illustration is by Todd Cahill. Todd is a steampunk artist and he illustrated my book. He had no experience with quantum physics whatsoever, but he managed to make absolutely gorgeous illustrations, including this one. Suppose that we have no idea where the particle is. It can be anywhere in the box, so its position is completely random. Suppose that we want to reset the particle's position to the box's right-hand side, so a nice clean state. This is like taking a messy sheet of scrap paper that's been scribbled on randomly and erasing it to a nice clean state. To erase the bits encoded by the gas, we first let the gas exchange heat with its surroundings, which have a fixed temperature, through the box's walls. To reset the particle's position, we can slide a partition into the box near the left-hand wall and push the partition to the box's center. The gas ends up trapped in the right-hand side. At what cost? We compress the gas, so we have to exert energy, namely work, the useful coordinated type of energy transferred between systems. So we spend work to reset the particle's position, to erase our bit of information. Erasure, an information processing task, costs work, a thermodynamic, resource. What's more, suppose that you want to compute and compute and compute and compute. Eventually, you'll run out of scrap paper. The universe doesn't contain an infinite supply of scrap paper, so you'll have to erase some. We just saw that erasure costs thermodynamic work. So, computation has an intrinsic thermodynamic cost. When I first learned that in my first quantum computing class, senior spring of college, it blew my mind. Because a priori, information and energy seem to have nothing to do with each other. But they turn out to be inextricably bound up. So Rolf Landauer, an information scientist at IBM, realized this in 1961. The process that we just saw is therefore called Landauer erasure. Now, what if we add quantum physics to this mix of energy and information? The story can change in many different ways. I'll share one way discovered by friends of mine, including the Portuguese physicist Lydia Del Rio. Suppose that we want to erase not a classical bit of information encoded in a gas particle's position, but a quantum bit, a qubit, a basic unit of quantum information. You can encode a qubit in an electron, say Audrey's electron from a few minutes ago. Audrey's qubits can be entangled with Baxter's qubits, in, again, some fixed temperature environment. Remember, if Audrey's particle is entangled with Baxter's as strongly as possible, and then Audrey measures her particle, she has no idea whether she'll obtain a one or a zero. The outcome is totally random. So Audrey's qubit resembles the gas particle bit whose location, left or right, zero or one, is totally random. My colleagues proved that Audrey can erase her qubits 
while actually gaining work that she can use to fill a battery or lift a tiny weight. This result should surprise us. Landauer said that we have to spend work to erase information. The trick is to sort of burn the correlations between the qubits. So entanglement serves as a sort of thermodynamic fuel when combined with heat. So quantum phenomena, such as entanglement, can serve as resources in thermodynamics, in gaining work, as well as in information processing, in erasing information. Beyond erasing information, we can build quantum thermodynamic engines, refrigerators, batteries, ratchets, and more. Quantum thermodynamicists have found that quantum phenomena can benefit these devices. We can use entanglement as a resource in refrigeration. We can charge quantum batteries at a greater power if we entangle them than if we don't. A quantum engine can perform more work on average than a classical counterpart by sort of burning information. And quantum engines can operate under conditions in which classical engines can't. These results not only help us extend Victorian thermodynamics into the, 20th century, the 21st century, but also shed light on what distinguishes the quantum world from the classical world. If we gaze into the future of quantum steampunk, what do we see? First, this field has been gaining momentum and participation sight unseen over the past decade. I expect the field to continue this upswing and increasingly join the ranks of established fields in physics, such as astrophysics and elementary particle physics and as of a few years ago, even quantum information science. Some of us quantum thermodynamicists are building bridges to long-established disciplines. Just as quantum information science has offered tools for transforming other fields, such as thermodynamics, we're now using quantum thermodynamics as a toolkit to understand black holes and chemistry and materials and more anew. Second, quantum thermodynamics has its roots in theory. From quantum thermodynamics, we've gained fundamental insights into what separates quantum from classical physics, what it means for time to flow, and more. But quantum thermodynamics is increasingly integrating with experiments to test the theory and to spark new theory. Personally, as a theorist, I'm working with four experimental labs now. And one uses atoms, uh, excuse me, one uses ions, two use artificial atoms, and one uses photons, particles of light. Most of the experiments happening now are proof of principle. They show that if we try hard enough, then we can operate quantum engines, for instance. But those engines aren't practical. The engines output less energy than we have to invest in cooling the engines down and manipulating them. So a third opportunity is to make quantum thermodynamics practical. The original theory of thermodynamics went hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution, which was eminently practical. So quantum thermodynamics should go hand in hand with similar utility. In another example, for my part, I'm working with experimentalists in Sweden on a quantum refrigerator for cooling quantum computers. Suppose that the quantum computer inside this classical refrigerator has just finished a computation. Its qubits are used up. To reset the qubits, you need to cool them even more. So you can put a quantum refrigerator inside the classical refrigerator to reset the qubits. 
the experimental test of our theory is actually taking place right now at Chalmers University in Sweden. Quantum thermodynamics is an incredibly exciting emerging field. It's vibrant and growing. It offers both fundamental insights and technological possibilities. When I was a master's student back in Waterloo, I read about steampunk in a novel. But the genre of fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. So the fantasy of steampunk is becoming reality. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it looks like we have our first question here. Um, entanglement can be burned, but classical information can't. Can you give us any insight on why, or is that really not expressible in non-math languages? And we could say more generally that correlations provide a resource in thermodynamic tasks. And yes, thank you for using the scare quotes even in the question. So. Um, Information is encoded in physical systems, but information itself um, is not a physical system. So technically it can't be burned. Hence the scare quotes, information just sort of serves as a thermodynamic fuel. You also need a source of heat around, but again, the heat is random and uncoordinated. So if it's all by itself, it's not going to do something very useful. But if you put the heat together with the information, with correlations, then you can accomplish work. And so, Classical correlations have been shown to be useful in thermodynamic tasks, but quantum correlations such as entanglement can be even stronger than the correlations achievable with just classical particles. So both are resources, but quantum correlations offer even more than classical do. Uh, related to the second part of that question where it talks about the non-math part, in, early on in your slides, you had a really scary slide with, with lots of math. And, and it scared me from reading the book. How much of that is in the book? None of it. The, the book has no equations in it. I did that because um, first there, I, I would like for the book to appeal to a wide range of readers, including readers who wouldn't usually think of themselves as science people. And also if you sit down with a really great physicist um, at, a lunch table and you start talking physics, physics, then they'll tell you a story to explain a piece of physics, just a story with the basic physics. They don't need to complicate the explanation with equations. Um, they more tell you a story about what's going on. And that's the style that I was aiming for in this book. Did, did you feel that reducing this to, to a story instead of equations helped you appreciate um, the, the science better? Absolutely. And writing this book has been really useful for my research because there were the book overviews, first it has some background needed to understand quantum thermodynamics, then it has uh, some an overview of some of the main subfields of quantum thermodynamics and some of the main results. And I, so quantum thermodynamics does have a lot of subfields, a lot of subcommunities, and I work in quite a few of them. And I, I basically like putting things together. But there are some of the subcommunities that I, I haven't worked in. And I had seen some of the results and maybe read some of the papers, but I hadn't really taken the time to distill out the basic physics story. And so forcing myself to do that was really useful for my scientific understanding. And I think when you distill out the basic physics, that's when you can most appreciate what's cool about the problem. Interesting. So we'll, we'll jump to the next question here. Um, I'll start to read it to you. Do you have any insights about how these new findings about thermodynamic nature of information might help us understand black holes and their information content? As I mentioned at the end of the talk, some of us in quantum thermodynamics are now using the tools of quantum thermodynamics to foray out into other fields and try to help people solve problems there or find new problems to solve. One of those fields is black hole physics, and that's one that I work in. So I 
definitely have found it useful to apply quantum thermodynamic thinking there. The way I got into this um, black hole quant and information community um, was because I felt that there was a certain class of quantum thermodynamic results, and I, I felt that one of these results could be proved about um, a feature of black holes. So as a, a basic recap for people who are unfamiliar with the black hole information paradox, there's this long standing, um, very famous story about black holes. The so black holes, um, once something passes the event horizon of a black hole, comes close enough to a black hole, then that object can never escape. It's just going to be sucked in. And a black hole so strongly attracts what comes close enough that not even light can escape. However, Stephen Hawking argued that a black hole will actually emit some radiation. So something from the black hole, more or less, can come out. So the black hole information paradox uh, can be thought of in terms of you know, some agent, let's call her Audrey, suppose that she has a secret that she writes down in her diary. She doesn't want for her obnoxious little brother Baxter to read the secret. So she throws her diary into the black hole thinking oh, nothing can escape from black holes. So he'll never find out my secret. But according to Hawking, Baxter could stay outside of the black hole and just catch this radiation that is coming out of the black hole. But the problem is this radiation is more or less featureless. It just looks like it's at some temperature and it doesn't really have any other properties as far as Baxter can see if he's just catching one particle and looking at it and catching the next particle and looking at it. So the question is, where did the information go? Uh, it's not entirely understood what happens to a black hole at the end of its lifetime, but one possibility is the black hole could radiate away all of its matter. So Baxter could end up holding the entire, uh, all of the mass that used to form the black hole, but he still, it seems like he still can't recollect uh, his sister's you know, secret. So where did the information go? And physicists believe that information, or a lot of physicists believe that information never actually disappears from the universe. So one um, way of thinking about this is the information is now entanglement, in entanglement spread all across all of the pieces of radiation. So Baxter won't be able to see it if he just looks at individual pieces, but he would have to perform some really complicated measurements on all of the particles in, ador, in order to recover the information. So that's a, a cartoon picture of the, the very basics of the black hole information paradox. Um, there are more problems being worked on. And one of the topics that um, experienced a lot of attention in the black hole information paradox community a few years ago was what happens in the black hole when Audrey throws her diary in. So the black hole mixes, scrambles the information up really, really quickly. And there was um, a, a signature of this scrambling process that was discovered. And I thought that it could be put together with a set of equations well known in quantum thermodynamics, which have a similar spirit. So I managed to prove one of these equations about the black hole signature. So it, uh, quantum thermodynamics um, definitely shares a lot of uh, I, concepts with the black hole information paradox community. And I think we can both, both communities can learn from each other. I think in, in this answer and in the book, you you brought up how, how some of your research involves you being an interdisciplinarian, which often puts you in the position of knowing less than everyone else in the room about whatever topic is under discussion. And you framed it this way, to others in the room, an, inter an interdisciplinarian may sound as though she was born yesterday. Um, it, it sounds like a rather difficult place to put yourself in where you have all this expertise and yet you know the least amount about the subject being discussed. Um, what, techniques to use to navigate this? Yeah, it's a difficult position to be in, but I really find it the most stimulating and the most fun because that's where most opportunities. So one resource that I've been really grateful for in helping me navigate these contexts that I don't really have the background for, it's been friendly experts in the other field. So I've learned, often I'll 
come up with some problem that I think is really interesting and I'll have half the tools needed to solve it. And I don't know what the other half of the tools, but I know someone out there has the other half of the tools. So I, I'll find such a person and convince them that the problem is interesting. So they want to work on it. And then they teach me their tools. We solve the problem together. And then I have a new toolkit that I can use to you know, come up with another problem. So I've been really grateful for how the, especially the quantum information and thermodynamics communities have been very friendly and collaborative. Interesting. Um, we'll, we'll jump to the next question here. Um, <laughs> follow up, perhaps because I said there aren't many equations, we have a follow up um, asking if there's a good reference that has equations, something short of a full grad textbook. Um, they, they added another comment saying they're really interested in reading the book. They just would like to know if there's more technical resource also. Yes, I appreciate it. Um, yes, there are a couple of reviews about quantum thermodynamics, this and especially this quantum information theoretic flavor of quantum thermodynamics that came out uh, in, I think, originally 2015. So one is by uh, Lydia Del Rio, whom I mentioned earlier in the talk, and uh, John Gould and others. So if you Google those names and quantum thermodynamics review, those sh that should show up. And at the same time, a review came out by Janet Anders and Sai Vinjanampathy. So the field moves really, really quickly. So a lot has happened in the years since those reviews, but I think that they're wonderful ways to ground yourself in the field. Um, great, we'll, we'll jump to the next question here. Do you have a gauge on recent developments using concepts from non-equilibrium thermodynamics to perform certain computations more efficiently than today's digital? Interesting. So in, let's see, we can think about, uh, there's certainly a lot of work on the relationship between um, computation and thermodynamics, both in the classical domain and in the quantum domain. I'm not sure of using of a way of using non-equilibrium statistical physics to come up with a new model of computing that's more efficient than the ones we have, but more I've encountered uses of thermodynamic concepts to say help with uh, removal of heat from a computer that operates because heat dissipation is one of the big problems or to convert information into work as we saw with um, Landauer erasure and the reverse of that process, which um, is more, uh, let's say, the, the reverse of erasure can convert um, information into work. So those are more of the perspectives that I've encountered. And also there are related subfields in which people think about how um, fluctuations and fixed temperature settings are related to say how DNA operates and that happens in biophysical settings. Um, great, well, we'll jump to the next question here. The information, sorry, the industrial revolution changed society and hasn't stopped yet. As this new quantum revolution comes, what changes may occur and how can we ensure that they help a more just equitable future? And that's a very astute comparison. The Industrial Revolution is a term that's very well known. Not quite as well known are the terms the first and second quantum revolutions. So the first quantum revolution was said to happen during the 1920s and 1930s. So this was when people were just figuring out the world is quantum. What is quantum physics and how does it work? So this is called the passive quantum revolution in addition to the second quantum revolution. What's happening now is called the active quantum revolution or the, um, sorry, 1920s and 1930s was first. And now we have the second quantum revolution. So people are using quantum phenomena to build 
uh, sensor, quantum sensors and computers and networks for communication and cryptographic systems and more. And yes, anytime we have, or when we have a new technology, there can be the opportunity for good and for evil. So I mentioned during my talk, the opportunity to, again, in an ideal scenario, if all works out as hoped, decrease energy consumption via trans transformation of fertilizer production. This is just one example of a revolution that we're hoping for in chemistry and material science that will be ideally enabled by quantum computers that can say simulate molecules and materials much more efficiently than quant than classical computers can. So on the one hand, you have the opportunity to say, solve the problem of fertilizer and perhaps drug design and so on. On the other hand, you know, some drugs are really not so great for society, are they? So I think that there's been uh, a lot of very thoughtful conversation over the past several decades and that is centered on analyzing the relationship between you know, science and the public good. Um, there are you know, academic programs centered on this, some scientific training programs require students to take ethics courses. So hopefully all of these will help inform our decisions as we come to have as we come to build tools that are of a new generation because they're based really on quantum physics and non-classical physics. In in the book, there's a certain picture that the characters encounter that, that they really talk about a lot and it, and it affected you as well. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So when I was in college, I interned in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian Libraries. So uh, as a little background, so a lot of people think of the Smithsonian as just a set of museums and it is an amazing set of museums, but it also has an amazing set of libraries including the Divner Library for rare books and special collections pertaining to the history of science and technology. So, for instance, my, my first day there, I was handed a first or second edition of Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius. So this just has some amazing treasures. So that's why I was in DC. But I had just signed my major card and sold my soul to the physics department. So I wanted to find out a bit more about this scientific life that I had signed up for. So I, I wandered over to the National Academy of Sciences headquarters, which is in Washington, DC. And I wandered inside. I don't know how I got past security, but for some reason, security let me in. And in the lobby, I found this beautiful painting in a steampunk style. And it's described in detail in the book. It's of a beautiful office or really creative thinking space with a window out onto a beautiful sky with some old fashioned apparatuses and some design sketched on the wall. And I just fell in love with it. It stayed on my mind. So during my PhD years later, I reached out to the painter, Robert Van Brinken, and he was kind enough to send me prints, which I now have right next to my desk. And this painting is called Everything at Once or One Thing at a Time which I think is so evocative. So not only does this painting have a steampunk style, but um, people might have heard of the concept of wave function collapse in quantum physics. You can have a particle that is in a superposition of, let's say, different locations. And in some ways, it acts kind of as though the particle is actually in multiple positions at the same time, very loosely speaking. But if you measure the particle's location, then only one location is recorded on your detector and you're said to collapse the wave function or quantum state. And so I think that quantum physics really is a dual answer to the question, everything at once or one thing at a time. So that painting has been a guiding light in multiple ways. Interesting. Um just this is this is a quick question, but from, from your book, I get the impression that physicists think inside the box a lot. Is that true? Physicists love examples of particles and boxes. And as we even saw in the talk that I just gave that 
the we can express the relationship between or under sort of see the relationship between information and energy by thinking about a gas particle in a box and so yes there are, there are lots of particles in boxes but um hopefully there is in the book a little more thinking that is outside of the box great um Thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure reading your book. It was a pleasure getting this chance to discuss it with you and learn more about it and learn more about how you interacted and the things that you've done. Um, Thanks so much, the book, it's been a pleasure. Oh yeah, the book is Quantum Steampunk. You can get it today in print, ebook, and audio. And the audio book is great too. I've been listening to it today. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.